I've had a considerable time in recent weeks to do some contemplation. Last Sunday morning during your time of your service, I had a little worship service of my own. I was reflecting on the, what I often called the great need for spiritual truth and religion in the world. A thought came to me, which is not new to me, but it's something that I have sort of evolved. Many of the problems that we experience in the so-called religious world is what I call grandstandism, using the vernacular of the contemporary season. We've tended for so long to think of spiritual things and of spiritual meetings and of religious convocations and all that goes with it. Something goes on out there, and we, we should be the participants and the players sit in the grandstand and watch. We watch the communion services, we watch the glittering spectacles of the religious liturgy performed. We watch as we have somebody pray for us, someone guide us, teach us. It's possible, for instance, to come to a meeting such as this, which is totally iconoclastic in terms of the usual religious service, but still be involved in grandstandism, sitting in the grandstand, watching, listening. It's all out there. And the challenge to all of us is to come out of the grandstand, get on the playing field. The game of life is to be played not something you watch from afar. When we get on the playing field, the first thing we find is that you're not watching something out there, you're looking within yourself. And the challenge is that in the first place we begin to think of life as having so many incongruities, things we can't understand. Especially when we cut ourselves loose from the people that guide us and teach us and pray for us and conduct the worship for us. In a sense, we're kind of alone. And yet we're not alone. As we say, the real need is, the real thing is we're all one. We have a new sense of unity. We find that it's important that at this time we take charge of our own lives. We can't put our lives in the hands of somebody else. It doesn't work. Many of us have lived most of our lives thinking that somebody else is responsible for us. A father, a mother, a spouse, the government, God, that's something from afar. We're always being supported and guided and directed and led and blessed, healed, succored. I didn't mean that to be a pun. It was S-U-C-C-O-R-A-D. We'll take the pun anyway, it's okay. <laughs> but we come to recognize that we must. We live in a universe of law. There's no caprice, there's no injustice. All this is something that we experience when we're looking from the outside in. We see ourselves involved in a universe of law. We recognize, however reluctantly, we have to take responsibility for our own lives. Take charge. That's hard. It's like a person being pushed out of the nest as a baby, as a little bird, on your own. Fly away, bird. So we leave home when we're young. If we don't, we should have. Run into life to make our own way. It's a fearsome life. There are many things we can't understand. How good it is that we begin to accept the possibilities of joy coming through taking charge. You see, what is involved is that things don't just happen. Life is not a matter of watching things come. You get good luck and you get bad luck and you have breaks and 
religious people perform miracles for you and you witness the miracle of the Bible, it's all out there. But we suddenly realize that if you can accept the fact that nothing ever just happens to you, nothing is ever unrelated to consciousness, your consciousness, no experiences are unrelated to ourselves. And we see that hard as it is to accept, we at least have participated in everything that's ever happened to us. Things didn't just happen. You didn't just get fired or meet someone and get married or have a difficulty and get a divorce or lose some money in the stock market. Things don't just happen. You're a participant in everything that happens in life. Unless you accept that, you miss the real key to life and living. You tend to hide yourself behind the cover of injustice. There ought to be a law. You can't trust people these days. Sickness just came upon me. I just caught a cold. He gave it to me. But you realize with the dawning light that you are participating in everything that happens. And the great thing that comes in realizing this, if you think it through, if things happen to you, if your problem is something that God laid on you, or if it's the recession that caused your financial difficulties, if it's my in-laws that caused the breakup of my marriage, I was looking out there for causes. If you insist that things that came about in your life were not of your doing, you may feel good about that and self-righteous. I can assure you, you're not going to get one bit of help. Because if the causes of things are out there, in God or in people or in luck or good, bad fortune, there's nothing you can do about it. You're dependent upon what they say or what they do or what God wills. But if you accept the fact that you participate in everything that happened, all the problems, then you can participate in the solution. Because if the problem, at least in part, is in your consciousness, by changing your consciousness, you can change the experience. That's a hard lesson to learn. The one who learns that lesson is out of the grandstand for good. You're in the swim of life. And the game of life is a beautiful experience. But you take charge of your own existence. We talk about spiritual law, divine law, metaphysical law, the laws of truth. This may be confusing. Because the use of the word law is actually a metaphor. Otherwise, we would say, as people have said to me, all these laws you talk about, why don't you give us the laws, one after another, like the Ten Commandments, so we can learn them and be done with it? <laughs> hey, with the laws of unfoldment, the laws of non-resistance, the laws of being, the laws of prosperity, the laws of success, the laws of healing, all these things. All these laws. Use of the word law is a metaphor. It simply means that we live a life that is an existence within a universe that is totally orderly. Nothing happens by chance. When you get yourself in tune with the flow of the universe and are willing to move with the universe and with the law, then things will always work out right and good for you. At least you will always have the potential within you to achieve, to overcome. Quite often we say, it was my good fortune to have, I got this job through sheer luck. What a lucky break. We all have those expressions. It's important that we get out of the luck, miracle syndrome. There's no such thing as luck in an orderly universe. It happened to you because you were there. Because in some way, beyond your knowing it, you have attracted it. And somehow in your consciousness, you've allowed the negative acceptance of things in the world, some of your own rebelliousness and your bitterness, your sense of injustice, your hurts, to graduate in consciousness, to create a kind of a viral infection of the mind. 
this will invariably outpicture itself in your, in your experience in the form of dis-ease, in the form of financial difficulties, in the form of inharmony, in the form of all the difficulties of life. The genesis of all these experiences, as far as you're concerned, is within you. You may go a long way resisting that. I especially remember a man who I got to know years ago. He was a good man. He was an upstanding member of the community. He tried to do right. He was honest. He had integrity. But the one thing he couldn't get through his mind was that this was an orderly universe. He would always say, but there ought to be a law. Like someone writing the Metro North saying, there ought to be, this is a heck of a way to run a railroad. There ought to be a law. This was Job's problem. Job railed to God. There ought to be a law. Why are you picking on me? Many people have that sense, sort of a paranoia. I would tell this man, there is a law. What about this and what about that? He wouldn't accept it. He gave him credit for it. He, he really tried. He labored over it. One Sunday, he didn't come to meetings very regularly on Sundays, but uh, as he had an aversion to a Sunday meeting from his early childhood. He got up and got dressed and decided he was going to church this day. He parked his car right across from the entrance to our building. In fact, it was a no parking zone, didn't bother many. After all, he was going to church. In the hour he came out, and lo and behold, there was a ticket on the window. The officer was still in the neighborhood, so he went up to the officer and he said, How come I got a ticket? I, I, I got up early and got dressed and shaved and got, went down to this church meeting and I got a ticket already. The officer said, What do you expect, a medal? This really shook him up, but he, uh, I give him credit for it, he tried, and one day he began to get the idea, it dawned in his consciousness. He got the idea that he lived in a universe of law. He saw that he was setting booby traps in his consciousness because of his bitterness, his resentment. He finally decided that he had to let go of what other people were doing. Stop seeing the fact that people were breaking the law with him. Recklessness, not any concern for a return, and yet some people seem to always get away with it. But he always had to pay for every piddling little infraction of the law. But he finally was willing to let it go. See himself in a universe of law. One time, some weeks before, when he first got this decided decision to come to one of our meetings, he was aware of the fact that. His life was a total shambles. His wife had divorced him. His children wouldn't talk to him. His business bankrupt. The physical condition of cataracts that were forming on his eyes. Once he got this realization of law and let go of what other people were doing, what is that to thee, follow thou me? And got himself in tune with the truth. His life turned around. The beautiful part was when he came to me this time and told me that his doctor had said that the cataracts had receded, apparently well on the way toward complete healing, which did eventually come. This man was just one of many who experienced a complete change in his life by getting out of the grandstand, getting into the swim of life, and playing the game. But in order to really fulfill this, we have to be willing to accept the fact that law is involved constantly. There's no real lawlessness in spirit. You can't break laws. You break yourself upon them. Thoughts, feelings, emotions, words all tend to build up in consciousness. Build a kind of a pool of negativity. And as within, so without. It's hard for us to accept the fact sometimes in the beginning when you see the difficulties of your life and the difficulties in the world. It's hard to convince yourself that Something in my consciousness has at least participated in this experience. But I can assure you, once you accept it, 
you know, deal with life on the standpoint of things working according to law and express a willingness to work with the law. You work with the idea that you have to give to receive. You have to be willing to forgive in order to be forgiven. You don't try to change things. You don't try to manipulate. You do your best and leave the rest. You put in your time at work, not just punching the time clock, but truly giving, serving. You're involved in a marriage relationship, not just in being there, but in loving and serving and cooperating, sharing. Working with the law. When you work with the law, the law works for you. There's a concept that has always been helpful to me. It deals with the law called the law of acceptance. It's another one of those laws that are metaphorical. But you always tend to experience that which you've accepted. Interesting thing, we can accept good things and bad things. When I was in the Army in the Second World War, I was in the Medical Corps. I was involved in teaching medical subjects, which I knew nothing about. But that was the way the Army did things. <laughs> Read the outline in the textbook before I went out of the classroom and uh, did the best I could. But I was involved in this one case of Materia uh, Medica, trying to stress the idea to the military men that they needed to unlearn a cliche that most of us grew up with, get your feet wet, you catch your death of cold. You've had somebody say to you, you catch your death of cold, get those wet shoes off, get dry your socks, and you'll catch your cold. The Army had uh, a self-interest in unlearning this because, as many know, the doughboys often spend a lot of time in mud and wet for weeks and an end. Had to break through this old concept of uh, the wet feet cold syndrome. The beautiful part was that many of these men later went, went into the service and uh, went, especially over in parts of Italy during the war, were wet and soaked for two weeks on end never caught cold, because they broke through this and you're accepting the possibility. See, you don't get, you don't get a cold from, from the puddle on the ground. You don't get a cold from wet feet, ever. But if, you, if you've accepted the belief that the cold will come through wet feet, then the cold comes from wet feet, because you've accepted that. That is, what are you accepting? The doctor gives you a prognosis of your condition, if you accept it, accept him as God rendering his judgment upon you, chances are very likely it will manifest in some way. If you accept the idea that during a recession or a depression, the jobs must be lost, finances must be difficult, money must be scarce, if you accept it, it becomes that way to you. Consciousness does strange things. If you say no to it, you usually accept it. And accept, on the other hand, the idea that you're a child of God, you live in a spiritual universe. There's only good coming forth to meet you. And reject all the negatives, and you begin to manifest a whole new experience in life. It's the law of acceptance. And the law says that you will never experience anything in body or affairs that you have not previously accepted in your mind and heart. You'll never experience anything in body or affairs, but you have not first of all experienced in some way accepted it in mind and heart. That's the law of acceptance. Out of this comes a little technique that I've used that is helpful to me. The need to build up a conscious acceptance, a realization that accepting the positive and rejecting the negative, you're using to accept the inevitability of something coming from a negative source creating what I call an acceptance quotient, AQ. How's your AQ? I like to remind myself once in a while, how's your AQ, Eric? Unlike the IQ, the AQ can be corrected, can be increased, can be expanded. IQ has been sort of discredited among educators anyway, but. Uh, the old idea was I'm, I'm 141 AQ, and that, that's the way it is. It's, it, 
explains why you're stupid or why you're brilliant. But your AQ, your acceptance quotient, can be corrected, expanded. Anytime you see someone meeting a crisis, such as that experience in the Bible in that vignette where Jesus was on the sea with the disciples and they were in a fishing boat and a great storm came up and Jesus was asleep in the bow of the boat, perfectly calm and at peace. The disciples waking him up, waking him up, Master, Master, save us. He stood up, quickly took stock of the wind and storms, spoke peace to them, and they're told that the calm prevailed. There may be other explanations for this, but in its essence, he shows courage facing up to a challenge. Napoleon once said that he'd never seen a person waking in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning and have complete courage. Usually there's a tendency of weakness or refusal to, inability to accept things as they are. But Jesus spoke to the storm, peace be still. The disciples had accepted the possibility that the storm could wreck the boat and drown them. Jesus had accepted the idea that we're always in the calm at the center of the storm. We can project this peace from our consciousness and cause the waves and the clouds and the storms and the rains to disappear. That's figurative, of course, but it's, it's important. Watch your acceptance quotient, your AQ. Watch your AQ. When you find yourself experiencing some difficulties in life and you're concerned about them and anxious over them and resentful and bitterness, bitter about them, perhaps, how's your AQ? What have you accepted? See, the idea of spiritual healing simply means that you must correct the tendency to accept the physicality of life. And all the lessons that tell you that uh, every day you're a little bit older, you ever expect these things for your age. A woman who went to a doctor with a knee that was hurting, he took it over and he said, well, for your age you have to accept these things to happen. She said, young man, she was on yours, young man, I'll let you know that I have one knee that works perfectly well. You can't tell me that it's my age because my right knee is perfectly well. <laughs> there are so many of those old wives' tales that are perpetuated in medical circles and in financial circles. Everything has to go downward. There's a spiral downward. The idea that the universe is running out. Life is being used up. Money is being expended. The important thing is to accept the truth that you live in the universe with a constant flow of good available to you if you can accept it. How much healing can you accept? You might say, well, I, I cured the pain, but I can't get rid of the condition because after all, after all what? You can say, after all, after all, you're a spiritual being in the universe. So there's no, no sickness. You've accepted it in some way. That acceptance becomes kind of emblazoned on our consciousness. It becomes a complex that we carry with us. It's important to know that we can change things. If we're willing to let go of the accepted icons that we have on the shelf, if we can think of life figuratively as a great metaphor, we should be able to walk into our brain and our mind, see the shelves laden with beautiful things, memories, ideas, accomplishments, the medals, if you will, the trophies. But also, if we're careful and alert, we'll see that on those shelves there are many negative icons relative to our inferiority, to the problems that come because that's just the way I am the icons of sickness and weakness, disease, the negative acceptances of life as the possibility of weakness and failure. Often a person going into business is told, nine out of every 10 businesses fail. This person feels he's got one ninth of a chance to win. That's not much of a chance, so he accepts the possibility of failure. The person who's conscious has a high IQ Acceptance quotient. Okay, if one out of ten 
Only one of ten succeed, nine of the ten fail. I'll be the one. Why not? Because if, if it's recognized that one out of ten can succeed, the implication is that you can succeed. Somebody's done it. That's the beautiful thing of recognizing the practical aspect of Christianity. Jesus said, all these things that I do, you can do too. Jesus did it. I can too. The fundamentalists might say, well, it's just one chance in a million that you have the miracle of life in you that would overcome this condition. One in a million? I'm the one. I accept it. I may seem to stretch things a little bit. It's so important that we see the possibilities involved. A young man, recently married, went off to work one day. He told his wife that he had to stay for a special meeting that night. It was a motivation meeting. The special speaker came to talk to the workers. The wife was a little bit apprehensive because she had accepted the idea. The first time the husband calls from the office and says he's got to stay that night, it's probably the beginning of the breakdown of the marriage. He's probably got some hanky-panky going on. She felt this pull within her. That couldn't be. After all, we're just married and we love each other. But he called and said he couldn't come home. So she was apprehensive all day. He came home late and she was already asleep. So when he awakened the next morning, he had to go to work early. She was still in bed asleep. When she awakened, she found a slip of paper on the dresser. The T-H-I-O. T-H-I-O. So that was something that he'd inadvertently forgotten. He began to think, can that be your name, Theo? <laughs> could it be the initials for the honeymoon is over? <laughs> so all her fears began to expand. Finally, she labored through this for hours. She finally called her husband. Would you please explain to me what this T-H-I-O is? This is a perfect example of explanation. The motivational speaker, at the main point of his lecture, time has its opportunities. And I wanted to remember so I could tell you the next morning. Time has its opportunities. It's a simple explanation. The simple fundamental. This is a part of the law of life. Every day things happen. And because the life is a series of challenges and bumps and scrapes and all the things that we go through, we will if we're positive, every challenge, every difficulty is an opportunity to grow. That's a part of the law of the universe. If you accept the idea that nothing ever happens by mistake. There's always something good in it. It may be the outpicturing of something negative. In the outpicturing, there's the opportunity to outgrow it. So whatever it is, the loss of a job, the breakup of marriage, financial difficulty, or just a cold in the nose, it's an opportunity to grow. Today has its opportunities. So I would suggest if you want to make a practical application of the few simple remarks we've made today, decide you're going to get into the game. Leave the grandstand. Don't be a witness, spectator. Be involved, a participant. You live in a universe of law. You can take charge of your life. Accept the idea that every day, the things that happen are opportunities to grow, to better yourself. Realize that it's important that you accept the best and leave the rest. Accept the good. Work to expand your consciousness of acceptance. Increase and expand your AQ. If you do this, then you're on the way to a tremendous unfoldment in truth and growth in consciousness. Let's be still for just a minute. Why don't you just envision the playing field of life See yourself for a moment sitting in the grandstand. 
watching the parade go by, watching the things that happen. Perhaps you're happy about it when they're not feeling bitter about the fact there ought to be a law. Things shouldn't happen like that. See yourself getting up out of the grandstand, walking down the, the ramp, out onto the field. Sort of embrace the whole field of life. As if to say, I'm accepting the fact that I'm in the game of life to stay. See yourself bestowed with a life of complete lawful experiences. You're in the universe of law. Make a commitment to live within the law. See yourself experiencing this game of life joyfully, thankfully. And give thanks that this day and every day, THIO, this day has its opportunities. Praise God for the truth that makes us free. So be it.